Well, maybe I'll just do this without slides because my slides actually are not that important. <laughs> There's they are, they're online. So yeah, you can walk along with it. And my slides are, are somewhat content free because uh, <laughs> I, I really took it seriously that when uh, I presented um, this topic that it would be a, a discussion. Um, I, I saw that there was this nice shorter um, thing where you could get input from everybody. So um, while I do have some um, ideas I want to present to you, I'm really hoping to get your opinion on um, some of the things that I'm going to talk about. Um, so f the first thing I want to do is um, introduce myself. Um, some of you guys know me, um, but a lot of you don't. Um, my name is Kristen Accardi, and I work for Intel's Open Source Technology Center. And uh, I um, have worked in the kernel for almost 20 years now. Um, it's been all over the place. Uh, I started out in networking and then I changed over to various other subsystems over the years. Um, what's notably lacking from my previous experience in the kernel is uh, security. Um, the, so this is my first try um, at security. The previous five years I've been working on um, power management and um, the thing that's really exciting about working on security is that it shares a lot of similarities with working on power management in that it's a system level problem that it takes uh, user space and kernel cooperation in order to solve. And also we have a lot of this, we had a lot of the same issues with having to make trade-offs that most of the time people would decide um, they didn't want your feature because it impacted performance or you'd put it in and somebody wouldn't turn it on. So I'm very familiar with a lot of the issues here. Um, the other thing that's very exciting is now that I've joined the security team, I have lots of people who are really excited to help me um, review my slides. Um, so when you're going through them, you can see that uh, they've had a lot of attention put to them. <laughs> um, so when I started on the security team in February, um, it was um, not entirely clear what I was going to work on. Um, one thing that was clear though was that um, the world was going to be um, changing a little bit for the next few years. We had recently had the Spectre and Meltdown attacks um, made public, and um, the theory is that uh, these attacks are now very exciting and new and are going to be something that we're gonna be hearing a lot of at least for the next few years. So I think that CPU microarchitectural side channel attacks are going to be something that uh, researchers are going to continue to work on. And so we as a, as a kernel community need to sort of anticipate that they're gonna keep coming. Um, so what can we do to get ourselves out of this cycle where we're constantly trying to um, to fight the latest thing. Um, how can we move to a place where side channel attacks are not quite as uh, destructive as they might be? Um, so that's where uh, I, can, I come in. Um, as they went through the uh, Spectre and Meltdown mitigation work last year, which started you know, over the summer, um, they came up with all kinds of ideas for things that they wish had been done better, but they didn't have time to work on it, right? When, when you're in the middle of working on a mitigation for a specific exploit, you don't have time to go back and do some long-term stuff. So this is really um, what my mission is. My mission is to try to find how we can um, prevent future, uh, be pro more proactive about preventing future side channel attacks and harden the kernel against other potential exploits. It's really important to note, not just because legal wants me to say this, but also because it's true, we're not trying to address specific CVEs or security gaps. What we're trying to do, and this is important because um, we don't expect anything that we're working on to be a 100% solution to, to any sort of uh, problem. What we're really trying to do are create spe speed bumps, um, things that will slow attackers down. So it's not going to be perfect security. There is a lot of overlap as a result with the work that Case is doing on KSPPP because um, what were really a lot of the things that we came up with that would make these side channel attacks harder are just general kernel hardening things. So what I'm going to do today is I want to walk through some of the project ideas that came out of the Spectre work last year and um, 
and that are now at the top of the priority list for my team. Um, I should let you know that uh, we're a very small team, including myself. There's two and a half people, if you count Casey as half a person. <laughs> And um, so we don't have a lot of people on our team. If any of these projects sound super duper exciting and you think, hey, I wish I could work on that, then you can come look at, come uh, meet me and maybe we can, we can hook up. Um, but, and the other thing, as I'm going through this list, if any of these projects seem totally ridiculous, I would really like to know about it, especially some of the longer term ones, because I certainly don't want to spend a year of my life on some of these things only to get a, a, a resounding no way in hell. All right. <laughs> so the first project I want to talk to you about is, uh, is kernel um, address randomization. So right now, you know we have KSLR um, implemented in the kernel. It's um, a little bit weak as it is. And um, some of the uh, side channel exploits that we had would take advantage of being able to easily get a kernel address. The other problem we have with the, with the existing implementation is that you find one and you find everything. So uh, one idea that's been thrown out, um, and this is kind of, I guess this is the scariest thing on my list from my point of view, uh, is the idea that maybe every time you boot the kernel, you should rearrange it. And so basically what this is going to do is relink the kernel on every boot. And the, the way we would do that is by incorporating a linker inside the kernel. And um, this isn't as weird as it sounds in that we sort of already have a linker in the kernel in the module loader. It's a pretty brain dead linker and it doesn't do what we would need it to do in order to achieve this. But you could use it as a foundation for doing this work. So the idea would be that we break the kernel up into effectively modules, but they're not really I mean, I guess modules are really just relocatable object files with a little bit of gunk thrown in there to make it easier to load them as a module. So you could modify the module loader to be able to just take .o files. We may be able to, to leverage any kind of um, vmalloc um, allocation algorithms that we could write that would um, be more random. And we might be able to basically take all of these .o files and create a new section in the um, binary. Now, right now, when the kernel boots up, it takes the compressed binary and it uncompresses it and then it does its loading. So what we would do is insert into that process a, a, a step where we take the kernel binary and we read the special um, section that we've added. We take all of our .o files, we rearrange them according to a spiffy random algorithm, and then we load them up into different places in memory. So that's kind of the idea that we have it now. Um, it has some, some benefits, obviously, otherwise we wouldn't be considering it. Um, it really does increase the difficulty on um, side channel attacks in that now um, when you find one address, that's all you really get. You're not gonna be able to get a second address. Um, and uh, also this is gonna strengthen what we've already got as far as KSLR. Um, the, the challenges um, to this is that uh, even fine-grained KSLR can be worked around, and it might be sufficient to have a single, single info leak um, in order to find the rest of the kernel. And it's, this certainly is going to increase the complexity of the kernel. It's gonna make it harder to reproduce bugs because now you might have issues where your kernel is arranged in a certain fashion and you only have a bug that happens when it's laid out in that particular way. We would have to probably make um, some allowances and maybe have a seed that we could export or whatever to try to reproduce uh, images. But the big thing would be that customers of distros are gonna be running different kernel images, all of them. So now instead of everybody running the same Ubuntu image or Fedora image, they're running, you know, they've got the code, but it's all rearranged. So it's gonna make it a little bit difficult um, for distros to be able to assume that they know exactly what the customers got. So um, this project is, uh, is still in the research phase. <laughs> so I'm, I'm interested if anybody uh, 
has any opinions. Um, there's an opinion over there. Do we have a microphone? <laughs> Uh, have you all thought about how this would impact live patching? Because uh, there are a number of environments that really rely on that for rolling out emergency bug fixes, especially when they're security related. I, I have wondered about live patching. Um, in yeah, that. It just seems to me this might make life much more difficult. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it would. <laughs> I wasn't actually sure how many how how prevalent it was to actually use live patching because when I was researching it, it seemed that many people considered this to be still fairly uh, out there as far as what people do. I think um, I am not an expert. I do not speak for Red Hat on this, but <laughs> I think when it happens, it's really important. Um, and it doesn't happen very often, but when it does, you really, really want to make it happen. So okay. putting huge roadblocks in its way without sorting that out, and I, I know we're not the only vendor to do it, is likely to be an issue. Okay, so don't break live patching. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a bit of a chicken and the egg problem. People don't adopt live patching because there are things that, that break it really badly. Um, There's one right over there. Uh, so I wanted to ask about, because we are randomizing things at boot time, uh, so I wanted to ask about entropy because this is something that can be a problem at boot time and especially when it comes to, from what I remember, virtual machines and things like that. So, I mean, you, you currently have issues with entropy already because you have to be able to, um, I mean, there's there's... Currently, requirements that you have a certain amount of entropy when you boot a VM, for example. And uh, I think that at the moment, we would have to rely on the existing um, entropy sources um, for what we're trying to do. That's a good question, though. I should be taking notes since no one can see what I'm doing. So more of a meta comment, but OpenBSD implemented something along these lines a number of years ago. They called it kernel address randomized link, or K-A-R-L. Carl, yes, I know all about Carl. So the, the main difference between what we're doing and Carl is that what Carl does is it actually recompiles the entire kernel at boot time. And so it will boot into a little mini user space, recompile the kernel, and then boot to that. Um, I actually considered this uh, uh, while we were looking at the architecture um, for this, and it seemed to me that this was more um, complex. I know that sounds weird because I'm talking about adding a linker into the kernel, but it did sound more complex than trying to do it um, without the user space portion. So the other thing was um, just as far as uh, adoption, I felt like it would be really hard to uh, coordinate. I think you'd have to sort of coordinate the uh, the image part, um, you know, the, the mini user space and everything with distros, and that just seemed hard. <laughs> Does it impact the uh, signature validation or measure measurements? The signature validation uh, measurements? measurements uh, since you're relocating the... Um, For secure boot? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I guess it would depend on what we wound up actually implementing and where you put those measurements. I'm going to write that down, though. What about secure boot? I wonder if in your research, um, if you found any precedents for this in any microkernel approaches where you know, you might have a much smaller footprint, you might ha still have the same problem at the core, but at least you've sh you know, pushed everything out 
of the core itself, but and then your recompile is a much smaller surface area, but did you come across anything similar at all as far as with microkernels? No, I can't say that I looked at any microkernel implementations. I did consider, you know, what is the difference between what we're doing and just really trying to um, strip the kernel down to a really core um, thing and then build everything else as a module. Uh, I think um, the uh, it's very similar to, what I'm tr proposing is very similar to that idea with the difference being um, that you don't have all the dependency uh, De dependencies between module because you're really still making a, a static monolithic binary at the end of the day once you load it up into memory. So you don't have the, um, the same, quite the same environment and also not the dependency on file system. Okay, so no one was throwing tomatoes too bad, I guess. <laughs> I guess uh, you're waiting for the first patch. Well, that'll take a while. <laughs> um, okay, so next project. This one's easier to talk about because it's in, it's in progress already and also it was conceptually less scary. Um, the idea here is that we wanted to um, apply uh, randomization not just to the kernel text section, but also to the module text section. Um, so these patches have already been posted on the mailing list. Some of you guys might have seen it, um, but I'll just sort of uh, run through the design for this. What we want to do here, um, currently the module text range is um, a gigabyte-ish, and so um, we've, we've apparently had um, proposals for doing this in the past and people were concerned about fragmentation of the memory area. So we try to solve this by basically splitting um, the existing module text range into two sections. And the first section is going to be um, where randomized text goes and then the second section is going to be linearly allocated. So if you fail to find a sufficiently um, large space inside the randomized section, then you can go and use the, um, the old way of doing it in the linear section. In practice, we found that it takes loading a, a large number of modules before you ever touch the randomized, I mean the linear section. And I don't have the numbers with me on how many um, it takes, but Rick has done a lot of testing now um, and after he was uh, given his first round of feedback and it's looking pretty good. And sort of a side effect to this is this new algorithm is actually a lot faster um, than uh, linearly allocated because now you're just basically bisecting the space and you're sort of randomly fitting. So your module load time actually improves uh, with this algorithm. Um, the uh, the other um, benefit to this is we've increased randomization. Now we get about 17 bits of entropy. And um, you can now link, <laughs> you could now uh, leak an address in one module and you don't automatically know where all the other modules are. Um, this one has the same sort of uh, challenges as the other project does in that um, it still might not be good enough. Um, one address leak could still be sufficient. Um, we have slightly increased memory usage due to the increase, increase in uh, page table entries that we have to have. And again, we, we wind up with increased complexity um, just because now you don't know where modules might be. But at the same time, this is, this is to me anyway, somewhat of a, a no-brainer thing to do. So. Um, you know, if you do have severe issues with this one, I guess you can still comment on the mailing list since we're not merged, but, um, or if you have any comments you wanna tell me right now about it. But I feel like this one's somewhat non-controversial. Um, just correct me if I'm wrong. Nope, okay. <laughs> Did that or you guys are realizing that lunchtime is in five minutes. Uh, okay, here's a, another idea. <laughs> this is a, a POC that we have. It's under development, so we're, we're pretty uh, excited about this one to the point where we've actually got things um, that we're working on. So um, the idea is that we need to start protecting pages that have secrets in them. 
And so our thought was that we should allow user space to be able to tell uh, the kernel that a page contains a secret that needs special protection. So we think that maybe you could add a new flag to the mlock2 system call. And this flag would be used in order to apply mitigations to the memory area and also maybe the process that's mapping it. And these mitigations might include things like making this page not dumpable, making it so that you don't copy or fork it, or even disabling caching on that particular page. Um, so uh, in this one, the only downside that I see is, of course, we're, we're adding a new um, system call that comes with all of the maintenance overhead of that. But um, I wasn't seeing any downsides to this one. I'm curious what people think. There's a there's a comment back there. So um, does it that potentially cause problems when you share pages with other processes? You might track them into, into accessing a page which has properties which you might not expect, and then you might have side channel attacks that you actually create with the system code instead of fixing them. I'm, I, could you repeat that? I'm not sure I understand. Well, I mean, you're not potentially changing the properties of user space page tables, and so now if you somehow find a way to trick another process into accessing the same page, you might have interesting side effects, which you might effectively create new issues rather than fix, like side channel I effects see. would be the I obvious I see what one. you're saying, yeah. Thank you. I'm writing it down. <laughs> Okay, um, I think this will be the last one um, since uh, it looks like we're almost out of time. Um, so the last project that I wanted to talk to you about today is um, removing basically cache breadcrumbs from um, data that might be lift, left behind um, in system calls. So this one's not addressing a particular attack per se. I, I don't know of an exploit that does this. But um, just sort of uh, thinking about it, if you call a system call and you don't really have permission um, to do what you ask the system call to do, you might still impact the um, cache by doing this. There might be things left behind as a result, even though you got a, eventually you got a you know e no perm or whatever. And so um, the thought was that. In an error path, it's likely not performance critical. And so what if every time we would return an error, we sort of randomly perturbed the cache a bit before returning back to user space? So um, for example, uh, any error that's, that's a real error and not sort of a fake error like try again or something like that, you might um, rewrite the cache. There's also a new um, MSR that you can use on on Intel processors, um, thanks to the L1TF issue. Um, we now have an MSR that we can use to wipe out parts of the cache, and otherwise you can do it the uh, old-fashioned way, just by reading random junk into it. <laughs> so um, this, this would uh, definitely impact performance on um, in the error path, but it's really easy to implement. Uh, it's very simple to understand. Um, it also would definitely make cache contents harder to guess on errors. Um, it would have increased, at least with the POC that I've done so far, when you're not able to use the MSR, it does come with increased memory consumption um, because of the junk that you have to um, put into the POC. I, I currently implemented it with sort of like a per CPU data area that's just, you know, twice as big as my L1 cache and just sort of randomly go out and touch it. and. Um, and mess things up, and I do mess things up pretty good. So um, anyway, uh, I'm curious what people think about this idea. It seems like a good idea to me, especially given that many of the cache probing attacks involve sending some wildly you know, out of bounds index um, into some system call. So if the system call is returning, you know, you know, Ian Valor, like what the hell are you doing? Yeah. Having it 
do something like that that slows down you know, the attacker uh, is actually kind of a good thing. I, th I think this is along the lines of uh, you know, possibly being able to do some sort of intrusion detection by monitoring you know, the error rates of system calls uh, on processes, right? So there's probably, I think, a lot of exploration that could be done there. Yeah, so to sort of be more in intelligent about applying it. If you know that you're going to be generating this, it's going to be slowing things down, could you use it as an attack as well? If you know you're going to be what? If you know that this is going to generate a performance hit, could you possibly be using this as an attack? An attack? Um, DOS attack, yeah. Oh, a DOS attack. The performance hit is not that bad. <laughs> Um, I'd, I'd be curious to see, uh, t to get numbers on how much it affected the existing uh, cache attacks, like uh, the, the side channels uh, with, with Meltdown, for example, um, actually, you know, take this mitigation and apply it with an un unmitigated uh, uh, CPU that's vulnerable to Meltdown and see what it does to it and try to change... Um, I mean, I, I imagine it would break all of the existing reproducers, but if you can try to update the reproducer to say, okay, to bypass this, we need to sample it, you know, a thousand times more or a million times more to sort of gauge how much this, uh, this would affect it. Because, I mean, I guess if you clear all of the cache, then you have no signal. Um, but if you're doing the random uh, updates, then trying to get a sense of how much uh, it, it would yeah, affect Yeah, that's the part I haven't um, got sorted out yet. I mean, right now in my POC, I just clear the entire cache, but I, I feel like that's probably overkill that you don't really need to do that. Yeah. Sometimes, some time ago, I've heard about <clears throat> Intel cache allocation technology. Uh, maybe we can think not uh, about spoiling the cache, but about separating, isolating caches for various groups of processes. So the, the cache allocation technology, um, it's not my area of expertise, but my understanding is that it applies to L3 cache and not L1 cache. So I think we still have some, some issues. Uh, I would ask. I would want to ask about the implementation of uh, such uh, modifications of cache because, uh, to me, it seems that uh, it would require basically a lot of manual work. Uh, because, for example, when we have something like IO control, then we have a lot of. Sometimes we have a lot of return error, this return error, that. So is there a plan for some kind of implementation of this that would not require like uh, thousands of uh, repetitive code, code insertions, some macro or something like that? So we, ha we have the MSR that they have in microcode that um, can be used on Intel platforms. I don't know what's available on other architectures, so I have been doing it the, the hard way um, it, in that case, uh, you know, when that MSR is not supported. Um, so cache probing techniques like prime and probe and flush and reload typically rely on knowing something about the cache geometry. So you're probing a particular cache line or an alias in cache line. So applying random cache perturbation is probably not, it might lower the signal to noise ratio on those, but it's, it's there is still probably going to be a reasonable signal to noise ratio left over for those style of techniques. So and you you advocate wiping the entire cache. I, I, I think time. if you were trying to do this, wiping the entire cache would be the, what you'd have to do, otherwise you're just lowering the signal to noise ratio. And I suspect that these things are quite resilient to random perturbation. There are lots of papers on how they're resilient to timing perturbation. Well, I guess it would depend on how, how random you're, you are, right? I mean, it, they, they would... I guess it depends. I, I suspect the thing that it's critically dependent on is how many samples you can make over time. Yeah. And given how resilient these things have been to timing perturbation in the past, I would strongly suspect they would be resilient to random cache maintenance. Well, it's certainly easier to just blow everything away. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you very much. If you want to talk about any of this further, I'm here. <laughs>